Welcome to Thrive Church. I'm so happy to have you here with us today. Uh, my name is Judah. I'm the lead pastor here at Thrive. And, uh, you know, we want to invite you to our worship night. We're doing an outdoor worship night next Friday at 6 p.m. Uh, it's going to be a great time. It might be a little bit chilly, so dress warm, but we're going to have a blast. There's going to be a food truck. There's going to be some uh, comedy routines. There's going to be uh, a couple different uh, uh, musical things going on. So we want to invite you to come to that next Friday, 6 o'clock. You might want to get here early to make sure you get parking. So um, we are in our series, though, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. And, and, uh, and throughout this series, we're studying different people from the book of the Bible called Judges. This is one of the first books in the Bible in the Old Testament. This is the part of the Bible before Jesus comes on the scene. There's a lots of wars in it. There's a lot of crazy stuff that goes on, and it kind of reminds me of what it must have been like in the Wild West, where all kinds of mayhem was going on, and, and, and the, the sheriff would come in and kind of bring law and order, and that's much like what these judges were. They were bringing law and order to the children of Israel. This was kind of the, the birth of the Jewish nation. And, and they would go through this cycle as a Jewish nation, this cycle of, of peace and prosperity, where the whole country would, would be experiencing God's peace. They would be prosperous, and then they would rebel against God. They would turn to worshiping false idols, and then they would get punished by God. Their punishment would usually come in the form of enemy attacks. Enemies would come and invade them, sometimes bringing them into foreign lands. Then the Israelites, the Jewish people, would turn. They would have remorse. They would repent and turn back to God. Then God would deliver them. He would restore their relationship. He would recover them. He would bring them back. And once again, they would have peace and prosperity, only to fall into idol worship again, only to get attacked again, only to repent again, to get forgiven. And the cycle would go on and on and on. This was a downward spiral over and over. If you've ever read it, it's almost depressing because it's like, don't you guys just learn? And then I wonder for us if we ever fall into a similar cycle like that. Do we ever fall into something similar where, where things are going good in our life and then we think, I don't really need God right now. I'm just gonna do what I wanna do. And so we begin to do what we wanna do and God kind of turns us over to, to the evil things in the world and then we come to a point where we hit rock bottom where we need restoration when we turn from our sins and he forgives us and brings restoration. Perhaps we continue the cycle as well. Well, we're looking today at a, at a judge and uh, we find the children of Israel once again in the middle of bad times. We're looking in Judges chapter 4, verse 1. After Ehud's death, the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. Like they just couldn't get it right. They just couldn't get it right. Like God would, would forgive them and then they would go and they would screw up all over again. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord turned them over to King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. So God's turning them over to Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king. Now, an interesting side note for any of you that may know biblical history. If you don't, that's okay. But Joshua, who was uh, one of the ones who led them into the promised land, was actually supposed to wipe out this nation, but he failed to do so. Had he wiped them out at the proper time, they would not be terrorizing them now. But here we find ourselves that they are being terrorized by King Jabin of Hazor, a Canaanite king, and the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth Hagoyim. I don't know if that's the exact pronunciation, but you're going to have to bear with me on that one. Sisera, verse 3, who had 900 iron chariots, ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help. So the cycle continues. The cycle continues. They had peace, but they turned their back to idols. Let's look at our own lives. 
What are the idols in our own lives? Do we ever find ourselves having idols in our own life? Now, maybe you don't have a, have a statue that you bow down and worship, a statue that you offer sacrifices to, but do we have idols? Maybe people or jobs or influence or money or entertainment or, or, or games or different things like that. Do we have idols in our life? What is an idol, you may ask in your notes? An idol is anything that clouds our vision of God. Anything that gets in the way of our vision of God, that is something that becomes an idol. It's taking uh, us and distracting us and getting our focus on that. And then we sacrifice things to these idols. We sacrifice our time. We sacrifice our money. We sacrifice our relationships to our idols. And that's where we find the Israelites. We find them in the situation where God has yet again turned them over to their enemies. They're being oppressed for 20 long years. They're being attacked and defeated. They're having to, to, to pay uh, this, this uh, other kingdom. They're, they're being treated cruelly. Again, in, in uh, let's see, verse three, it says Sisera had 900 chariots. Well, Josephus also wrote about Jabin and Sisera and, and, and estimated that they had around an infantry of 300,000 uh, foot soldiers that they had. They had a cavalry, mounted troops of around 10,000, and they had around 3,000 chariots. Now, now, a chariot, keep in mind, back then was the equivalent of a, what a tank is now. Most of these uh, enemy nations, they didn't really have much state-of-the-art weaponry. Maybe they, had a, maybe they had a sword, but most of them had just some like long poles maybe. Maybe they had uh, sickles for, for harvesting, things like that. They didn't have advanced armors uh, and, and weapons, but when a chariot would come through, a chariot could fight uh, tens of 20, 30, 40, 50 people at once because they had so much power and speed from the one chariot, and they have 900 coming in to attack them at this time. No one could stand against Sisera and Jabin. See, Sisera was the commander of the army, and they would go through and just dominate and decimate all of the surrounding countries and villages and cities. So finally, finally, after 20 long years, the children of Israel, God's chosen people, turn and ask God for help. How long does it take for us before we turn and ask God for help? Like, what do we have to go through? How deep does rock bottom have to be before we turn to God and ask for help? They waited 20 long years. How long is it for you they, until you turn and ask God? We say, well, I don't know. I don't know if God wants to hear from me. I don't know. I mean, how could God forgive? God forgave them time and time and time again. In your notes, if you're taking them, God has a soft spot in his heart when you call out to him. God has a soft spot for each and every one of you. When you call out to him, he promises to always hear. He promises to hear our cries, our pleas for help, and he will be there. No matter how far we've gone, no matter what crazy things we've done, he promises to be there for us. So we continue on here in Judges chapter four, verse four. Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth was a prophet who was judging Israel at the time. Deborah, she's a prophet judging all of Israel. So here we come to another judge. Interesting difference of this judge is this is the only judge that was a, was a female, was a woman. And here she is, she's judging Israel. Verse five, she would sit under the palm of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel, must have been her tree. They, they named it after her. She'd sit there between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites would go to her for judgment. One day she sent for Barak, the son of Abinoam, who lived in Kadesh in the land of Naphtali. And she said to him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Call out 10,000 warriors from the tribes of Naphtali and Zebulun at Mount Tabor. And I will call out Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the Kishon Valley. And there I will give you victory over him. So God is speaking through Deborah and saying, here's what we're going to do, Barak. I want you to call out 10,000 warriors, and I'm going to lead out Sisera, and I'm going to bring out his chariots and all of his warriors, and we're all going to meet at the Kishon River, and there a battle is going to go down, and you are going to win the battle. 
Now it's interesting if you study the book of Judges, most of the judges became judges after they won a battle. Like they would come in, like Gideon, uh, like Jephthah, these people, that they, they were kind of a nobody. They would come in, they would lead them into battle, they'd win, and everybody would be like, wow, you're our judge. Deborah is unique in the sense that she was already a judge even before they went to war. She's already a judge, she's sitting there, she already is one, she's a judge and a prophet as well. No other judge also, no other judge gets their own tree either, right? Like she's got her own palm tree for crying out loud. Like this is great. It must have been a tropical environment. She's just sitting there sipping like, you know, coconut milk and just, you know, people are coming to her and she's solving problems and, and she's just doing all this stuff. It's great. It's a great life that she's living. But now she's about to lead the people into war and she's called a prophet. What is a prophet? Prophet, we think a prophet is someone who can just tell the future, right? But that's not really what a prophet is, especially not in the Bible. A prophet was someone who would speak on behalf of the Lord, who would have a message from God that they would bring this message to the people. Now, let me be very clear that being a prophet in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament was the highest honor and the highest of spiritual gifts. It was the highest function in the kingdom as well in the church was this function of a prophet. And here, Deborah is a prophet. Now it saddens me that throughout church history, people, there are people who use the Bible to try to lessen a woman's position in the church. And if they did so, they would do very well to study the life of Deborah, to study the life also of Miriam and Huldah and Anna who lived in the temple and Philip's four daughters and Priscilla and countless of other women in the Bible who played significant roles. So many people have far too long taken verses out of 1 Timothy and 1 Corinthians. They've taken them out of context to limit what a woman can do in a church. And I believe that is not of God at all. In fact, in your notes, God is the great liberator and has made us all equal in his eyes. God is the one who equalizes, who brings unity. In that culture, it was not particularly acceptable to have a woman leader. In this day and age, we're used to it. But back then, it wasn't acceptable. But she stood up in the role that God had called her to. Look what it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have been put, have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. This is a key and a pivotal verse for anyone who wants to argue otherwise, that we are all one in Christ. We all have the, the same giftings and abilities that God pours out on us, and if God pours out a gift on you, you need to use it regardless of what your position, regardless of your gender, regardless of your ethnicity, we need to stand firm and confident in the gifting that God has given us. So here Deborah is. She's judging people. She's not looking and she's not seeking them out, right? She's not going around saying, hey, everybody, come follow me. Hey, everybody, come follow me. She's not, not trying to beg people to come follow her. In fact, she just sits under a tree all day and people come to her. They just keep coming. There's a long line. You know, they just want to see her. They're seeking her out. You got a dispute with your neighbor? Hey, go see Debbie. She will help you out with the situation. You need some advice in your life? Go see Debbie. Oh, you, you don't know what, what land you should buy? Go and talk to Deborah. She'll help you out. She's usually hanging out under the palm tree. So, Deborah was there. She was a judge in this civilization. She was judging people, helping to solve disputes. In this culture, it wasn't generally acceptable, but she realized that God had called her and God had uniquely equipped her, and she did not shrink down from that calling. She did not shrink down. She spoke with confidence and she spoke with boldness. I remember. Uh, when my sister was very young, she was probably, you know, five or six years old, and, and we were, we were uh, away on a, on a trip, and we were playing hide-and-seek in an unfamiliar house, and 
uh, someone was hiding in this basement. It had like this trap door down into this dark, dark basement. And, and you know, a lot of times kids are afraid of situations like that. And, and my, my brothers who were older than her, they were kind of afraid of going down. It was so dark and it was scary. They weren't really sure. And I just remember seeing the boldness of my sister. She just walked right by them, marched down into the blackness of the basement. Like, I'm going to find whoever's down there. And see, that's like what Deborah was. She was willing to go wherever she needed to go, wherever God called her to go. See, in your notes, we need to step out in confidence when God calls you to do something. Step out in confidence. She calls in this guy, Barak. She calls him in and says, hey, I want you to assemble an army of 10,000 people. It was an undersized army. They were really no competition for their enemies. But she says, here's what I want you to do. Assemble this army. God will bring our enemy down to this valley and there's gonna be a war that goes down. Look what Barak tells her in uh, chapter four, verse eight. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. He needs his mama to come, you know. It's like, I'll go, but only if you come, Deborah. You're the judge. You're the one under the tree. You got to come with me. You got to come make sure everything's okay. She's like, very well. I will go with you. But you will receive no honor in this venture, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh. You know, I mean, in the back of his mind, he's probably thinking like, yeah, right. Like, it's not going to be, it's going to be me. We're going to come back. I'm going to get all the glory. Nobody's going to believe anything. Like, they're just going to look at me because I'm the, the strong guy. They're going to say, oh, you know, oh, he's the hero there. No, no. She's like, you are not going to get the credit for this victory because you wouldn't just go in there and do what God has asked you to do. So she went with him to Kadesh. And at Kadesh, Barak called together all the tribes of Zebulun and Naphtali, and 10,000 warriors went up with them. And Deborah also went with them. So she's going into battle, like she's bold. You know, she's like, let's go, let's, let's have at it. We're going into battle. She was confident in the word that God had given her. She was confident going there. And, 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 and here Barak, he's like bargaining, like I'll go if you go. But see, because Barak refused to act on his own, the glory of the victory was taken away from him. And here he is. Sometimes we refuse to, to do the things that, that, that God asks. Maybe you feel like God is calling you to do something in your life. You say, well, I don't know if I should do that. You know, if God is calling you to do something, to help somebody, to influence something, and you don't do it, it may not change the outcome because God's will will generally take place regardless, but it does change how impacted you will be or how benefited you will be by the entire situation. I've seen this happen before where God, you know, says, hey, why don't you go do something? And if you sit back too long and delay, maybe God goes and picks somebody else to go and do the very thing that he had called you to do. In your notes, if God wants to work through someone and they refuse, he'll just use somebody else. See, we say, you know, here I am, God. I want you to use me. I want you to use me for your glory. But here we see Barak, he was hesitant. He was hesitant to be used by God. See, God's work will still happen. He'll just use somebody else. And then you miss out on being used as an instrument of God. So here the armies collide. 10,000 warriors led by Deborah and Barak. And then who knows how many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of the enemy forces all descend on this valley. And they come in here. But most people, most theologians and historians speculate that as the battle was beginning to commence, that a downpour happened. See, the next chapter is called Deborah's Song. And it basically tells the exact same story, but it tells it in the form of, of a poem. It's a highly regarded war poem, a war song. Many people speculate this is actually the oldest writing in the entire Bible is, is Judges 5. So this, in there, it implies that there was actually a downpour at the beginning of the battle. And as you can imagine, the chariots going through could not make any progress. You know, I remember as a kid, we would go 
uh, four wheeling. We go, you know, we go out in the mud. We would go do all kinds of crazy things. And I remember so many times, you know, we would be in the mud or somebody else would be in the mud and they're like, I got to get out of the mud. So you know what they do? They floor it. And then you see mud flying everywhere. And meanwhile, you see the vehicle slowly descending deeper and deeper into the mud. Like this doesn't work for, that's not how this works, okay? That's not how you get out of a situation like that. And so you can imagine 900 chariots being pulled by horses and they're all going and then, oh, they hit the mud and they all begin, start beginning to sink. Now they're immobilized. Now what once was an impenetrable army now becomes easily defeatable. So the Israelites sweep in and begin to easily conquer their enemy. The enemy loses the war. Everyone is fleeing for their life. They're all scattered. And Sisera, the commander of the army, runs. Judges chapter four, verse 17. I like this. This is kind of hardcore, but I like this, you know. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with King Jabin of Hazor. Okay, I'm just gonna pause there for a second because there's a lot of names there. Um, Heber's family was actually a distant relative of Moses. And, and they kind of settled between these two lands and they kind of had peace treaties with both sides. Some people think they might have been spies. Some people think they might have been suppliers of something. Maybe they were even, you know, uh, helping to, to care for all the horses. We don't know exactly, okay? But, but Heber's family, it says, was on friendly terms with King Jabin of Hazor. So King Jabin, Sisera, they're all friends, okay? So, so uh, Sisera's running, sees a friendly house. He knows that they're kind of allies. He goes there. And Jael, the wife, comes out to meet Sisera and says, come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. And he went into her tent and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I'm thirsty. Well, she didn't give him water. She gave him milk. I, I don't know. If I'm thirsty, I don't want milk, okay? I, and this, this was probably soured milk, too. Like, I, that's just not what I want. But that's what she gave him. Milk from a leather bag. It's probably curdled. And, and, and so he's drinking all this and covered him again. Verse 20. So stand at the door, he told her. If anyone comes and asks you if there's anyone here, say no. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, Jael quickly crept up with a hammer and with a tent peg in her hand. And she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground, and he died. Crazy stuff. Like, like this girl was hardcore, okay? I mean, she goes up, he's sleeping. She's like, okay, I think he's asleep. Now, she's probably, she, she, she's a, you know, a traveling kind of nomadic lifestyle, probably always putting up tents. She knows how to put up a tent. She knows how to drive a stake in the ground. But this time, she's also driving it through his head into the ground. Sorry, I know this is a little gory, but it's in the Bible. You know, it's funny, I've heard people talk about this before. And they're like upset that JL lied. Because they're like, well, she said to come in and he'll be safe. I'm like, really? You're concerned about her lying? She drove a tent through, a stake through his head. <laughs> like she killed the guy right there. She drove it through. I think we can let the little lie slide, okay? Now, here's the thing. The fact is, is that God not only used Deborah in this situation, right? But he also used JL. He also used her. He used her to, to fulfill the prophecy of Deborah, that, that Sisera would die at the hands of a woman. And then in Deborah's song, she gives praise to Jael for what she did. We'll take a look at this last verse in uh, Judges chapter 5, verse 24. It says, most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. May she be blessed above all women who live in tents. Wow ever been living in a tent? She's more blessed than you are, okay? It's kind of funny because there's only two women in the Bible that are called blessed in this context. One is Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the other is Jael, who drove a tent sp a spike through a dude's head as he slept after she gave him some curdled milk, possibly, from running there. It says, more blessed, the most blessed among women is Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. May she be blessed among women. You know, everybody, all these guys say, I just want a Proverbs 31 wife. How about a judge's four and five wife, okay? How about one who's willing to drive a tent stake through the head of your enemies, okay? Like, like maybe that's what we should be looking for. 
Oh, man. Some of you are getting too excited about that one. I would say that Deborah was not bad or ugly, but she was good. But she was unlikely. She was unlikely. She, she, was, she was probably was looked down upon because she didn't fit the mold of a judge. Probably people doubted her. Even Barack doubted her. She's like, yeah, you know, come on. You know, you're coming with me if we're, if we're going into this. They might not have taken her seriously. She was underestimated, overlooked, but God still used her in a powerful way. So much so that after this war, it began a period of 40 years of peace in the land of Israel. 40 years of peace because a woman judge took a stand when no one else would. She prophesied when people thought it wasn't right for her to do so. She led troops into a battle. She did what no one else would do. And now you may feel overlooked in your life. You may feel underqualified to accomplish the things that you feel God has put on your life to do. Maybe you feel like he's called you to get involved with something. Maybe you feel like he's called you to share your faith or, or, or to start a ministry or to serve people who are hurting or to give generously. Maybe you feel like I'm just not good enough, but let me tell you, God wants to use you. Just as God used other underdogs throughout history, he used a David and a Gideon and a Jephthah and a Peter and a Deborah and a Jael and people like you and people like me. So God can use you to accomplish his purpose here on this earth. See, that's the point here is God is looking for the underdog. He's looking for the person who doesn't have it all together. He's looking for the good, the bad, and the ugly. He's looking for someone who's weak. God wants to use someone unexpected to accomplish his unexpected work here on this earth. God wants to use you if we are willing to step up, if we're willing to be bold, if we're willing to walk confidently in what he has called us to do and not shy away from his calling. God wants to use you to carry out his mission here on this earth. The question is, is will we answer that call? Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We thank you for people like Deborah and crazy people like Jael who did things for your glory, for your honor. They took risks. They were bold. They were confident in walking in the task that you set before them. Let us, O oh Lord, be like Deborah being willing to take a stand, being willing to lead when you've called us to lead, being willing to open up our mouth when you give us a message to say. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus is your Lord, he wants to use you. He wants to invite you into his family. God's word says that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Won't you call on his name? God's word says that if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and you say with your mouth, Jesus, you're my Lord, that you are saved, won't you call on his name now and say, Jesus, you are my Lord. Use me like you used Deborah. Father, we want to be used by you. We want to take a stand for you. We want to be bold. Like Deborah, Jael, Jephthah, and Gideon. Lord, we know we've got some baggage in our life. We know we're not all put together. We've got some broken pieces here and there. Maybe we're a little more bad and ugly than good. But we trust that you can put those pieces together, that you can use us, even if everyone else has overlooked us and underestimated us and thought less of us and said that we don't measure up. We know that you can work through us because you love to use the weak things. You love to use the foolish things. You love to use the overlooked to accomplish your great work here on this earth. So we invite you and say, use us, Lord, as you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together and sing.